um, what was your journey? What led you into this field? So I kept on getting infections and I kept on getting ill and having to go on antibiotics. And it got to the point after having so many different tests that the doctor just, when I said to him, like, what's wrong with me? He said, Tim, I don't know. I shrugged his shoulders. I can't help you anymore, basically. I was, at, I was at the end of the road, really. I mean, I was really close to just giving up. The biohacking movement has picked up speed as people who have been unable to get answers from their doctors seek to biohack their way out of stress, fatigue, illness, and depression. In episode one of season two of Becoming Unstoppable, we explore this movement, why millions are flocking to it, and hear from the key influencers who are driving it. This episode is not to be missed. In season one of Becoming Unstoppable, I packed up my life and went on a 90-day mission to biohack my way back to health. I used the latest wearable tech to alleviate stress, took lab tests to uncover nutritional deficiencies that mimic psychological disorders, tested nootropics to improve brain function, and more. In season two, we dive deeper into the field of biohacking. You'll hear from world-renowned biohacker Dave Asprey, author of Fats for Fuel, Dr. Joseph McCullough, brain and memory expert Jim Quick, and more. Join us for season two now so you can become unstoppable in your own life. After half a million views of season one of my docu-series and my new book Unstoppable becoming an international bestseller, I decided to continue my journey into the rapidly growing biohacking space to dispel many common myths about it and look at the latest advancements into health that's empowering millions to take back control of their lives. To do so, I jumped on a plane and travelled to the Beverly Hills, Los Angeles to attend the Upgrade Labs Biohacking Conference that features some of the biggest names in the industry, including Dave Asprey and Ariana Huffington. Thousands attended it from around the world with a mission to become unstoppable in body and in mind. Today, we'll speak to the experts and discuss what biohacking is, the common misconceptions, the impact of EMF on our bodies and our brains, as well as nutrition, and why you shouldn't blame a lack of willpower on a or mental attitude alone. Let's dive in. They didn't give any of the background, they just said what my morning routine was like. And I had people calling me Christian Bale off of American Psycho because I'm so like oh regimen with my routine. But if they had known it was because I was chasing health, yeah, then it would have been a different story. So it went viral, like ridiculously viral, um, really? negatively. But I had a lot of positive outcomes as a result. Yeah, um, I did. So what were the symptoms you were presenting with at the time? Um, so fatigue, frequent urination, anywhere from 30 to 50 times a day, which would then cause prostate issues because you're just going to pee so much um, and because of the antibiotics, bloating, serious bloating and not digesting food properly and like, I couldn't even hold an umbrella up at one point. I was walking up the road and I just didn't have the energy to hold an umbrella up. It, was, it got to that point and from someone that would usually be 200 miles an hour from you know the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed. Yeah, that's, that's when I realized that you know, I have to fix it. So for those that don't know, what is biohacking? What are the basics? Biohacking is a new word in the English language. And Merriam-Webster's added it to the dictionary uh, at the end of last year. Congratulations, that's your doing, right? <laughs> uh, I think so, but my name's in the definition, which is kind of cool. And it is the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so that you have full control of your own biology. Yeah. And, and it, I designed this, I built a community around this in order to bring together neuroscience and meditation and exercise and nutrition and medicine and stuff they do for astronauts and anything else that we know that is going to change human performance. Because instead of focusing on that's for a racehorse, that's for a Navy SEAL, that's for an actress, to focus on, wait, all of us wanted control. Maybe you wanted to be extra smart. Maybe I wanted to live to 180 years. Maybe that person wanted the most abs of anyone ever. It, it's, a, it's all control that we wanted. That's why biohacking matters. So what's the most common misconception about biohacking? Because there's a lot of misconceptions about it out there. You know, one of the misconceptions is that, oh, it, it's for guys. Because okay. Bulletproof is, you know, the brand that built biohacking, we're 50-50 men and women. And women are better biohackers than men. Yeah. And the reason is that guys tend to live a little bit more up from their head. And we have all these onboard sensors inside the body that you can learn to tune into that show you how you're doing. And women are just naturally more wired to do that because they have greater fluctuations in hormones. 
And so like, oh, I don't feel the same now than I did before. So they just have an awareness. And a lot of guys, like, I don't know, I walked into the wall and it hurt. Other than that, we're completely <laughs> clueless. Yeah. Right? So it's actually a gift in order to have that, that additional just physical awareness. Uh, and that is, you know, gross generalization. I'm sure there are some guys who are super, <laughs> you know, into it. And there's some women who have no clue. But on average, I find that when I, I bring up biohacking in a room full of women, like, oh, yeah. Okay, we like that name for it, but, but yeah. it's really something that's for everyone. Do you think with the term biohacking, it's empowering people by giving them some kind of identity to attach themselves to? We used to think, oh, we're weird. Because you were that one person, like, I'm actually not eating that because it doesn't make me feel good. Everyone would say, a calorie is a calorie, and then you just kind of roll your eyes. Or you know, the person says, if I don't dim my room at night, I just can't sleep. And I learned that about myself. And people say, you're weird. That's not true. You're just crazy. So now all the people used to be considered just crazy, now we're biohackers. And it's not crazy at all. It's actually backed by science. New scientists come out every time. And when you take all of our knowledge and you stick it together, you end up building superhumans. Which is way cool. So we're actually kicking the butts of the people who said we were crazy 10 years ago because now we have a name. Now depression is on the rise, suicide as well. What do you say to individuals who are potentially have a food sensitivity or side effects from medication that are changing their psychological behavior, but they're actually blaming themselves on a poor mental attitude? Well, to, to uh, understand that that may not be the case, that there may be external factors that are contributing to that. And certainly foods sensitivity is one. Uh, and, 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 it's, and, and foods, it's not so much what you eat, it's what you don't eat that may be more important. Because uh, one of the most dangerous foods you can eat is a processed oil or industrially processed oil that is heated and fried. So like a French fry or a donut would be classic examples of foods that could be a problem and these fats actually get digested and your and your body uses those as building blocks to integrate into your cellular structures and parts like your cell membrane especially in your brain when and if those are uh, constructed in a, in a defective matter then you're going to have dysfunction in your brain too and that and that's just at a structural level uh, but then there's other environmental forces that that we're relatively unaware of Cell phones are indeed the cigarettes of the 21st century. And, and, and cell phones being representative of wireless devices and EM, pretty pervasive EMF exposures that are relatively new to us, that didn't exist much before 20 years ago at the levels that we're now experiencing. And these uh, exposures can activate very sensitive channels called voltage-gated calcium channels that are pretty much in every cell in your body, but are particularly high concentrations in nervous tissue like the brain and the heart. So if people have arrhythmias, you know, they may be particularly sensitive to this and, and virtually no one is looking at the EMF exposure as a solution to identifying that. But similarly, neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, EMF exposure can be a really significant contribution. So if you combine that, the EMF exposures with uh, uh, other issues would be sleep, you know, we come to uh, uh, not value sleep as we have done historically. And we've been able to hack that in the wrong direction by all this blue light at night, suppressing our melatonin, not getting like high quality sleep, our circadian rhythms are disrupted. We're not getting enough. I mean, Matthew Walker is a researcher out at, uh, I believe, Berkeley, and he's written enormously on this. He's probably one of the finest researchers in the field and wrote the book, uh, Why We Sleep, which goes into great detail. It's got a lot of good podcasts on it too. And so just something that's foundationally basic is getting eight hours of high quality sleep with low EMF exposure and then eating the foods. I mean, then you start activating your whole biological processes that are designed to keep you healthy. So almost every physician is taught and believes fully sincerely, and this is the way they treat themselves or their family members or their spouse, that diseases are essentially drug deficiency. You know, that they don't understand that our bodies were absolutely designed to stay healthy. That that is the, that is the code. You've got to do, they do not want to be sick. That is, that, that is an aberration and it's usually for exposure to variables like the ones I just mentioned that causes them to veer off in the wrong direction. So once you address those, there's no magic you need to do. Your body self-corrects. Really, magic is probably the closest description because it, 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 it's, it defines a science that we don't yet fully understand. And there's not a micro doubt in my mind that we, we have no comprehension of the 
enormous ben metabolic benefits that occur from addressing the fundamental ancestral uh, guidelines that, that our ancestors have followed, that once we're following them, your body will self-correct. We have some idea of how it works, but we don't fully understand it because it's addressing pathways that probably haven't even been discovered yet. So, and, and certainly brain health and brain function and neuropsychiatric challenges can be an example of one of them. There are so many others though. I mean, we are dropping like flies from cancer and heart disease, which virtually were unheard of a century ago. We didn't have these disease. People were dying from accidents or old age. So can you talk about how biohacking has changed your life and what you want people to know about it? But biohacking, attaching myself to the label of being a biohacker has been important, one, for community and to see that there's loads of people out there like me, um, that I'm not just crazy on my own enjoying supplements to fuel cellular deficiencies um, and having a movement, movement and community, which is, from an evolutional standpoint, is really important to us. That's that. So I think, for me, I've grown up from being a selfish little prick of a businessman that just cared about building businesses to going actually it's bigger than that and it's about helping people and having amazing relationships. I think what Dave has built from, from Bulletproof Coffee, um, which was people see as a product um, and whatnot, I think it's fueled a massive area in the health industry that is just growing exponentially. And I think the more and more awareness around it, just from coming from coffee, which is where it did come from, I think the mindset is the key thing, and that's optimizing your health by exploring different areas and looking at N equals one and tracking your data to see how your body performs, understanding that everyone's different. You know, vegan for a period of time, ketogenic for a period of time, whatever it is that your body needs, opposed to attaching yourself to a label of I am vegan, but my health's not getting better, but it, it worked originally. Do what works now. Um, and being open to that. So that's what biohacking means for me in terms of saving, saving, saving me um, and others around me. So what did I take away from this conference? Well, that the biohacking movement is highly misunderstood. The strategies people are employing to optimize their physical and mental health are based on countless studies and the latest wearable tech and supplements are well researched and led by some of the world leaders in neuroscience, nutrition, and medical advancements. Is it here to stay? Absolutely. As people still continue to fail to get answers from their healthcare professionals, it's only propelling it forward and at a rapid pace. So now what? Well, at the end of the conference, I picked up trial wearable devices and new supplements that I'll experiment with for 30 days each, then report back to you weekly in the rest of this series. We'll also share extended interviews with the many experts I interviewed over the course of the conference. And if you'd love to become unstoppable in your own life, head over to areyouunstoppable.com to take our success identity type quiz so you can get personalized recommendations for increasing your energy, decreasing fatigue, and performing at your best. In the meantime, be sure to grab a copy of my new book, Unstoppable, share, like, and subscribe to my channel and we'll see you for next week's episode.